sing that song. Now I guess I'll have to love to hear you sing it. For those who are visiting with us, our pastor is away on vacation. He's at the beach. And that's all I'll say. I will not tell you what I told him. That's confidential between me and my pastor. But hopefully he'll be back next Sunday, okay? Keep him and his family in prayer. They need to get away. If you would, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, one verse, verse 11. And the Word of God said, And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We're going to focus upon pastors. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we come into your presence, we thank you this day for the opportunity that we have to be here for this service. I pray, God, that all of us here today can say that you are mine and live it each and every day so others would want you as well. Now, Father, may your will be done in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I was 23 years old, about 100 years ago, when I first felt God calling me to preach his word. That was something I did not want to do. I had no desire. I enjoyed doing what I was doing. And I'm not bragging, I was good at what I was doing, but more than that, I enjoyed what I was doing. So as God began to deal with me in, in regard to calling me to a, a different type of ministry in life, I said, no, Brother Jim, I didn't want to do it. And for four years, I told God no. I played the Jonah for those four years. I ran from the will of God. My belly of the great fish was Fairfield Industries in Stratford, Ontario, Canada. It was there that I yielded to the call of God to preach His Word. It was a Monday morning. I had gone through the plan as it was my custom and spoke to the employees. Then I had a meeting with the various foremen of the various departments. And I went back to my office to work on some reports that I had to send in to the head office. As I was involved in filling out those reports and making those reports, I heard an audible voice behind me, and that voice said, Jerry, I will ask you one more time, will you preach my word? At that moment, I felt like that would be the last time God would ever ask me to do that. That it might be the last time that I ever hear those words. For the first time in over a year, I immediately dropped to my knees and I said, God, if that's what you want, that's what I will do. The rest, as they say, is history. For 38 years, I served God as a pastor. I retired at the end of December in 2012. I have a love and a deep appreciation for the men that God has called and placed in the office of the pastor. You see, biblically speaking, within the church, there are only two offices in the church. That is the office of the pastor and the office of the deacon. Today, we're going to look at the office of the pastor and I want to speak to you on this topic, simple, because I am a simple-minded man. And if you don't believe me, my mama is sitting right there, and she can tell you I am a simple-minded person. Yes, she's my mama. If you don't believe it, go to Jacksonville, North Carolina, and ask Bobby Allen Jarman who that woman is. He'll tell you she's the preacher's mama. Ain't that what he said? She don't like it, but that's what he said. 
my pastor. I want us to think about that. Our responsibility as a church to my pastor. My responsibility as an individual to my pastor. Here in Ephesians 4, 11, God said that he gave some. God gave some and he lists various ministries that God called individuals to. One of those was pastor. The pastor, my pastor, is supposed to be a God-called and a God-gifted man placed within the church where I'm a member of to carry out God's plan and God's will in and through that church. He is to preach the Word of God. He is to teach the Word of God. He is to minister to the individuals who come into the fellowship of that church. He is to serve God as a pastor, as a shepherd to the flock that God brings to him. Basically and literally, he is the earthly overseer of the local church. That's what God's Word says. I expect my pastor to be a God-called and a God-gifted man. Now, I would like to say that every man who stands behind this podium in any church is a God-called and a God-gifted man, but I know, sadly to say, that is not true. A friend of mine had a friend who was a pastor, not because he was God-called and God-gifted, but because the woman that he was in love with would not marry him because he was not a pastor, Brother Tony. She wanted to marry a pastor, and my wife would say, why? What's wrong with that woman? But then she told me after I became a pastor that she'd always dreamed of marrying a preacher. I guess that's why she chased after her pastor there at Mount Zion, no. She did like his son, though. And I've got some stories to tell about that preacher's son, but not today. He became a pastor because the woman he was in love with wanted to be married to a pastor. Now, you can imagine the end result, and if you imagine the worst, you're true. One Sunday morning in my first church, there was a man walked boldly into my office, my study, and he stood before me and he proudly said, I'm pastor, and I won't give you his name. You might be related to the, well, anyway. He said, God gave me a sermon to preach to this church this morning, and I'm here to preach it. Calmly, I stood up. I said, sir, where do you pastor? My church, he said, is not an earthly church. It's an unseen church. I gave him the best advice I knew to give him. I walked around and stood in front of him, and I said, Sir, I suggest you go preach your sermon to that unseen church. And I led him to the door and escorted him out of my study. You see, he revealed to me when he said, I pastor the unseen church, that he was not a pastor in the biblical concept of that word. Now, I'm not here to preach human concepts. I'm here to preach the Word of God. God's Word is what I look to and what I lean upon. That's what I receive my instruction from. The word pastor in the church, in the Word of God, means a man that God has called and God has gifted and God has placed in a local assembly, a local church, to preach the Word, to teach the Word, to minister to those people and to accomplish God's will through that. But it's going to be a man like Brian Childers. I'm to expect, and at any time a church has to call a new pastor, that church needs to make sure that pastor has given evidence that he has been called of God and gifted by God to do the task that we're going to call him to do. Brian does not Well, let me put it this way. I had a man to tell me one time. He 
a member of the church I pastored, he said, you best not ever forget that you're held accountable to us. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, for sir, first and foremost of all, I'm accountable to God before I'm accountable to you. And I'm not concerned about being accountable to you, but I am concerned about being accountable to God. Brian is God's man, God called and God gifted. He is first and foremost of all accountable to God, and we best not ever forget that. But then there is another passage of Scripture I want to share with you. And one in light of that, that you may not be aware of, then you may. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, and in verse 17, the Word of God says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the Word and doctrine. The word elders refers to the pastor of the church. I'm not going to run that gamut. I don't have time. Take my word for it. God says, let the elder, let the pastor be counted of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. The word rule does not mean to have authority over. It means to minister to. It means to be concerned about. It means to take care of. God said the man that is placed in our, well, let's say Brian. He's not here. <laughs> I believe with all of my being that God placed Brian in the position that he's in at this point in time in our church. <clears throat> God said if Brian ministers well, if he does his job as I, God has said, as I have called him to do, he said he is worthy. He is worthy of double honor. That means in respect, and that means in salary. If you don't understand that, see me later when I got more time, and I'll run those words with you. We're to pay him well. You've heard the old saying, Lord, you keep him humble, and we'll keep him poor. I don't know. Well, I won't go there. <clears throat> God said, Brian is worthy of a salary that will take care of he and his family. But it also says he is worthy of respect due to his calling as a pastor of the church, due to his calling by God, due to his gifting of God. Brian is worthy of respect. Just... When did Gary call me? It was about a few months ago. A few months ago, Gary Three, a friend of mine, who just retur retired from the Foreign Mission Board, called me and he said, Jerry Bryant, I recognize his voice. There's only one that said, he was from Marshville, North Carolina, the home of Randy Travis. But Gary says, no, it's the home of Gary Three. He said, Jerry, I want to ask you a question. I said, what, Gary? I recognized his voice. He said, have you sicked any she-bears on anybody lately? In 2 Kings, chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, or verse 23, said he, speaking of Elisha, went up from thence unto Bethel as he was going up by the way. There came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Gary and some of my collegiate buddies, I was as slick on top then as I am now. I used to do what another pastor did. I had a comb over. Gary and them used to love to call me baldy. And one day I read this verse of Scripture to them. And the next verse says, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods and tear forty and two of them up. 
I told Jerry and my buddies, I said, y'all walk across the campus careful. There may be some she-bears coming after y'all. But it was in fun. I said, no, Jerry, I haven't sicked any she-bears on anybody since you and I walked across the campus at Gardner Webb. And I said, I must not have been a man of God because they didn't come out and tear y'all up. Now listen, those in here, it says little children. It's the Hebrew word na'ar, and it means anywhere from anyone from a teenager on up to a young man. These weren't little children as you and I think of it, as it is written in the King James Version. They were teenagers up. And they were ridiculing and mocking and showing disrespect to the man that God had anointed and God had called to lead his people. And the word of God said that Elisha cursed them in the name of the Lord. You know what Elisha did? He simply turned them over to God. He was literally saying, God, okay, you deal with this. And guess what? God did. <clears throat> with that said God expects you and I to show Brian the respect that is due to him by his office by his calling and gifting of God now I could say well Brian's just 50 to 53 years old nobody ought to be that young I've got children older than Brian And I guess, young man, you're younger than that. I can tell you married a young wife. She looks to be about 17. I could say to Ryan and I could say to Brian, <clears throat> I'm 76 years old. I've been around a lot, lot longer than you. Now guess who's heard that? I could say that. Brian, I've been around longer than you, and I know more than you. Watch out, here come the she-bears. I could say to Brian, my education is different than yours. I could say a lot of things, but you know what? God won't let me say them, and I don't want to say them because it will be showing disrespect to the man that God put behind this pulpit. God put him for a, here for a specific reason and a specific purpose, and I am to show him respect. It doesn't matter that I'm older than him. It doesn't matter that my education may be different than his. What God is telling me is he is my pastor, and I am to show him the respect that he is due as my pastor, and I intend to show him the respect that is due him as my pastor. But then God says something else that we need to consider about my pastor. God says that my pastor needs time to prepare and to teach and preached the word of God. God says, as Paul wrote to Timothy, you are to study to show thyself what? Approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My pastor must have time, and I must give him time to prepare to teach and preach the Word of God as he stands before the people of God any time that he stands before us. Have you ever thought about how much time it takes for a preacher to write a sermon or a Bible study if he writes his own? Now, and he should write his own. That's what God's called him to do. I never will forget what a man said one time, and I've never forgotten it. He said, I know more about what my congregation needs 
than some man who wrote a commentary in 1898. Do you know how long it takes? In a recent survey among pastors, the average time to write a sermon or a Bible study was 13 plus hours. Now, for a man as dumb as I am, it's on the far side of the plus of 13. If he writes two sermons and a Bible study a week, that's 39 plus hours. That shoots a 40-hour work week, doesn't it? In that same survey, 90% of the pastors surveyed said they worked an average of 50 or 55 to 75 hours a week. But it will take 13 plus hours for him to put together a sermon or a Bible study. That takes time, people. Now let me ask you a question. What if every day that he's in his study, seven of us walk in and say, Preacher, I want to talk with you a little bit. There's nothing to talk about. We just want to talk to him. Not going into any problems, not going into any detail. We just want to talk to the preacher. Do you think he's going to have that 13 plus hours to put in on a sermon? No. I thank God that as I was a pastor, God led into my life some of the greatest women I've ever met other than my wife. And those secretaries guarded my hours and my time in that study. When you called and you asked to speak to the pastor or the preacher, as most of them called me, they would say, may I ask what this is about? And if they didn't feel like they didn't deserve my attention, they would say, okay, would you call back after lunch? And he'll be glad to talk to you. I told the congregation, everyone I went said, let me have my mornings to study. I'm a morning person. My brain shuts down after lunch. I don't like to think. I don't like to do anything that calls for thinking after lunch. I just like to eat my lunch and lay around. Sleep. Dream. Go fishing. I don't go golfing. God, Christ didn't have a golfer among the disciples, but he did have some fishermen. They would come by and drop in and they'd say, I want to see the pastor. I want to see the preacher. May I ask what it's about? If it wasn't important, they would hear the same words. Well, if you'll come back after lunch, I'll tell him you're coming by and he'll speak to you. They guarded my time and gave me the time that I needed to put together the message in the Bible studies that I had to teach and preach. If we don't give Brian the time and he gets in the pulpit and fires a blank, guess what? It's not his fault. It's our fault. Make sure we afford him the time that he needs to prepare to teach the Word of God. Then we need to make sure, and this, if you don't hear anything else, you hear this. We need to make sure, according to 1 Timothy 5, 8, that Brian has time for his family. Listen to what God said. But if any man provide for not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is a non-believer, one who doesn't believe in God. God said, and please listen to me closely, the most important people, group of people in Brian's life is not us. It's his family. That's the most important group of people in his life is his family. God said that if he doesn't provide for, if he doesn't give fault to, if he doesn't pay attention to, if he doesn't take care of the physical, the spiritual, the mental, and the emotional needs of his family, he's worse than an infidel, a non-believer. And that's true of every man. 
If you don't like that, take it up with God. He's the one that said it. That means Bri, before ministry to us, ministry to his family comes first. My first year, freshman year at Garden Well College, second semester I was assigned to an internship under Dr. Fred McGeehee. At that time he was a pastor of Double Shoals Baptist Church in Shelby, North Carolina. One of the best things God ever did in my life was place him in my life. In one of our meetings, he looked at me and he said, Jerry, I want you to promise me to do something. I said, what's that, Dr. McGeehee? He said, I want you to let every congregation that you pastor know and let your wife know that she is the most important woman in your life. He said, you make sure you keep your home fires burning. Let the congregation know. Let everyone know, including your wife, that your wife is the most important woman in your life. And then he went on and he said, and you let your congregation and your children know, your family know, that your, your family is the most important group of people in your life. Then he read it and quoted 1 Timothy 5.8. I said, Dr. McGee, I will do that. And I have. Recently, God recalled to my mind a church that I was at in a revival meeting. Church members came to me and they applauded and applauded and applauded. They commended and commended and commended to me their pastor for the time that he gave to the congregation. They said things like, anytime I call day or night, he comes right there. He's so faithful to minister to our church family. He gives of his time in ministry. He gives of his time and you're going to think it's strange that I say this, but I'm going to say it. That disturbed me, and you know why? Because his wife confided in me that he never had time for her. He never had time for his children. He was always doing, and she said, quote, ministry. That marriage ended in divorce. Then those who slapped the pastor on the back and commended him for all the time that he had given to them called for his resignation. One day I was in a store. One of the members walked up to me and he said the wrong thing. He said, I can't believe that our pastor didn't take any more time for his family. I don't understand it. I said, I do. And let me clarify it for you. I said because the church he pastored didn't give him time to spend with his family. You always had to have him. You always needed him. And then he loved the accolades more than he loved his family. Oh, they were bragging on him all the time to his face, and he got off on that. I said the problem lies at two doorsteps, the doorstep of the church and the doorstep of the pastor. In that recent survey, 80% of the pastors said the church had taken or had brought harm and disunity to the family. 80% said the church has disrupted my family life. There again, I would say to those 80% of pastors, it lies at two doorsteps, the doorstep of the church and the doorstep of the pastor. Let us understand this is a directive from God. The most important group of people in Brian's life is his family. Biblically speaking, this would be the priority list in the priority order of any pastor. God, family, and church. That's from the Word of God. But right quickly, I don't want the Methodists meet us to the, beat us to the restaurant. We need to give time for the man of God, 
Judy Jiggly, my pages together. We need to give time to the man of God for himself. For himself. Jesus did something that I've never forgotten. Jesus and his disciples were ministering and ministering and ministering. And the word of God, well, let me just read it. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. And he said unto them, speaking to the disciples, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They had no time to rest and recuperate from their ministry. And Jesus said, come with me. We're going over here, and we're going to rest a while. We've got to give Brian time for himself to recover, to recuperate, to restore himself physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. We as a church can kill that man, literally. Brian, may she, Brian don't know I'm preaching this sermon unless he's watching. If he's watching, Brian, I hope you ain't. Well, anyway, start to let it slip. Brian relayed to some of us at a table the other night that he's having a problem with his blood pressure. And these were his words. I've never had problem with blood pressure. Old stick his foot in his mouth, Jerry came up and said, well, you've never pastored Appalachia before either. <laughs> I can't help it. What does old Vance Havner once said, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket. He looked at me and he said, well, I guess that's true. I don't know exactly what the membership of our church is right now, but at one time it was over 1,600. First time I checked several years ago, it could be under that, it could be over that. But that's too many people for one man. But do you know we expect him to minister to every one of them? How do I know that? Because it's in our bylaws. On page 6 of our bylaws under the responsibilities of the pastor, it says that the pastor is to, take, to care for and pastor the members of the church as well as the community. We not only expect him to minister to every one of the members of our church, but to the community as well. Now, we could say, well, some of them don't come. Why minister to him? Because we told him he has to. It's in our bylaws. Now, can I take you a step further? Well, you may not want me to, but I'm going to anyway. Do you realize that we are not only a church, we are also a nonprofit corporation? Now, I don't know what the church was told when the church incorporated. I wasn't here then. I was a part of Jacksonville, Bethlehem Baptist Church Incorporated. We kept our church family informed all, of all things every step of the way. I said, we're not going to do this and come up and people not know it. If they don't know it, they weren't there when we talked about it. But do you know as a nonprofit corporation registered with the state of South Carolina, the state of South Carolina has what is called a Nonprofit Corporation Act that everybody who incorporates signs an agreement, they will abide by that document. That's part of the law of the state of South Carolina. And Appalachian Baptist Church, whoever signed those incorporation papers, obligated the church to abide by that document. That document states that every member of the corporation is entitled to the privileges listed in the bylaws. So the state of South Carolina expects Brian to pastor and care for every member of the church and members of the community. But, hold on, we're going a step further. I'm not going to read these verses. I'll let you read them when you get home. In Matthew chapter 
21. Verses 20 through 22. Some people tried to trip up Jesus. Do we pay tax? Jesus said, give me a coin. They gave him a coin. They said, he said, whose inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He said, you give to Caesar what's Caesar, and you give to God what's God's. Then in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, God's Word says that we as believers are to obey the laws of the land, including the laws of South Carolina. Matthew, that verse is a scripture in Matthew, contains a verb that is a, an imperative, means it's a command. That ver- passage in Romans contains an imperative, means it's a command. God has commanded us that we obey the laws of the land unless the laws of the land cause us to violate the word of God. God comes first. But if those laws do not take us away from God, God has commanded that we obey them. That means God has commanded. Brian, because it's in our bylaws to minister to and care for every member of the church and the community at large. People, that's too many people for Brian to take care of. And if he tries, it's going to kill him. And if it does, don't let us cry at his funeral because we're the ones who put him there. The stress, Paul even himself said in the letter to the church at Corinth, the burden of the churches has worn me to a frazzle. That's Route 2 Hudson paraphrase. He said, it has burdened me down. Paul said that. Let us make sure that Brian has time and Brian takes time for himself to recover, to recuperate, to replenish what he puts out ministering to us. There's no doubt in my mind that my pastor is a God-called and a God-gifted man. There's no question in my mind that I am to give Brian time to prepare his messages, time for his family. I'm to give him time for himself. I am to give him respect. God expects that of me. God expects that of you. Now, our invitation is going to be just a little bit different. Frank and Ryan, would you come and stand right here, please? Hurry up. We don't want the Methodists to beat us, remember? Ryan, I can understand him being slow. He's old, but you ain't. I want you all to stand right over here in front, please. Oh, it's beauty and then, okay, I understand. Get a little closer together, brothers. We ain't going to talk about you. I want all of our active deacons to come and stand beside on either side of these two men. All active deacons. If there ain't none here, shame on them. If you'll stand on either side of them, please, kind of balance it out. Right now, you're not making this commitment to me. You're making it to God, and you're making it to Brian. I want you to stand for just a moment with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Listen to me closely. If you will commit yourself to the principles that I shared with you this morning in support of our pastor, Brian Childers, I want you to come. One of these men may be your deacon. You can come to him. You can come to Frank. You can come to Ryan. And let them know that you're going to support our pastor physically, spiritually, emotionally. And that you'll do everything that you can to undergird him, enable him in their role that God has placed him here. 
If you're willing to do that, I ask you to come. Take one of these deacons, one of these staff members by the hand and let them know that you're committing yourself to the total welfare of our pastor. You want to pray with them for our pastor, you pray. But don't come if you don't mean it now. But if you mean it, I want you to come and make that commitment here this morning. And if you'll just remain standing after you speak to them, here at the front or wherever you can, And if you're not physically able to come, if you would make that commitment, would you simply raise your hand? I'm not looking. Give these others a little chance to get here, and then we're going to have a closing prayer. Now remember, Brian is not the only, he's our pastor, but we got two other staff members. We have our minister of music and we have our minister to our youth. They need your support prayerfully, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally as well. And I pray that you'll give it to them as well. Let them know that you're going to care for them just as you do our pastor. For they've been called of God in a different way, but God has called them and God has gifted them to the task that before them. Father God, as we come into your presence, I know from being a pastor for over 38 years that it's not always an easy task. But Father, it is one I would do over again in a heartbeat because it's your will for my life. And I ran from that will for four years. But what a joy it was and what a pleasure it was when I yielded. Yes, God, there were hard times. There were difficult times. There were sad times. But there were times of joy, times of great blessing, great rewards received. Father, more so than the positives, more than the negatives. But I pray that we as a church, will understand Brian's relationship with you and his relationship with us. Let us not put on him that which you would not have to be placed upon. Let us treat him with respect and dignity. Let us give him time for study, time for his family, time for himself. Let us make sure, God, that he is healthy, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally. And thank you, God, for sending him our way. Thank you for sending to us Ryan, and thank you for sending to us Frank. God, I pray your blessings continue upon their ministry as well, and that we will undergird them and give them the same care that as we do our pastor. Now, God, utilize Appalachian Baptist Church in a great and mighty way to reach the community, to reach the brokenhearted, to bring healing to those who need healing and salvation to those who need salvation. Thank you, God, for us being a part of such a great church. In Jesus' name we pray.